Let's go to the word today, Malachi, the third chapter. I'm a little disappointed that Sister JJ isn't here because this is her most favorite chapter in all of the 66 books. And I'm going to preach all over the place in it today. So, Sister Nancy, you're going to have to make sure that she gets online and that she sees this. <laughs> and I want to remind you, you know, we forget about it, especially now the cameras, you know, everything's in the wall and it's, you know, inconspicuous. But I want to remind you that much of what we do in this church goes beyond the walls of this church. And there are many, many people all over this country and across the oceans that do watch this service and that uh, receive the word of God because of what is done in this church. So I'm grateful for those who are with us online today. And I want to tell you that the Holy Ghost is here and he's going to speak to you. If you will just receive the word of God, I want to tell you today that God has allowed you to hear this message. It will change you from this day forward because God has a word for you if you will receive it. Church, I want to tell you today, this is an uncommon message. I did not just open a book uh, that is uh, designed for pastors just to go to number 32C and just pull something out and insert in the blanks a personal experience to make it seem a little bit more polished and a little bit more genuine. But I've come to tell you that I've been on the mountain with God. I've come to tell you today that the Lord is speaking one more time to his people. And the thing about God speaking is it will change you on a spiritually molecular level. And no book of sermons will ever do that. Amen? Are you ready to receive the word of God today? Because that is every bit as important as the preparation that I have gone through with God to deliver this to you. Every bit is as important today that you prepare yourself to receive. Amen? Praise God. Malachi, the third chapter, the second verse. I want to bring your attention to a few things in this chapter that you have avoided, uh, like the plague, because of the middle part. And we all know the middle part. The middle part is, uh, is, is the part that says, will a man rob God? You have robbed me in tithes and offerings. Bring your tithe into the storehouse. See, we're getting this out of the way at the beginning, so you don't have to be scared about what I'm going to preach. Bring your tithe into the storehouse. And you know what? I'll pour out a blessing upon you that you can't contain. And not only that, I will rebuke the devourer on your behalf if you'll do what I've just laid out here. And that's the middle of this chapter. It's the part that you probably uh, know about this chapter, but we're going to go to the beginning and we're going to go to the end because something happens before and after the scriptures that we're so familiar with. The third chapter, the second verse, it says, but who may abide the day of his coming and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. Now let me stop here and just say that um, this passage was the inspiration for a church that Brother Glenn Baker, raise your hand Brother Glenn, and myself probably 23, 4, 5 years ago in Los Angeles area helped to start. And uh, of course Brother Glenn much more than myself, but I was there in the beginning and the two beautiful ladies sitting next to Glenn Baker, wave your hand, beautiful ladies, <laughs> Monique and Rini, they attended that church for many years. And so there's a connection uh, to a lot of us that goes way back. Right, Nancy? Right, Darlene? <laughs> you know, nothing is by accident in the kingdom of God. God knows what he's doing, and he has a plan in place. Amen. But I draw your attention to that because this is a concept that is going to be very familiar to you. And if you know anything about me, you know that I always take you from the familiar to the less familiar. 
and then we start to hear something that we've never heard before. And so let's start with the familiar. God is speaking here and he is saying that he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. The next verse says this, and he shall sit, God shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi. Now, who were the sons of Levi? The Levitical priesthood. He will purify the sons of Levi by purging them. It says he'll purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Now, I said the concept of purifying gold is very familiar. I've heard at least a billion messages on it myself, and you probably have heard at least half a billion messages uh, on that. I don't know how the math works out and how many you'd have to hear a day for that to be true, but, um, but um, you're supposed to laugh at the exaggeration. Uh, insert laughter. Note to self during editing. So God is the one purifying the gold. He's the refiner. He's the refiner. Oh, did you think that he just stepped away and said, oh, yes, everybody else refine them for me? No, God himself is the refiner. He is a fire. As a matter of fact, the book of Hebrews says that our God is a consuming fire. It should not be something that is foreign to you if you've had any kind of relationship with the Lord over any kind of time period. Because you're going to have to go through some things to serve the Lord. You're going to have to go through some things to walk away from the world and to say that I belong to Jesus. Because you know what? The world is not real happy when those that are part of it step away and say, no, I've decided to follow Jesus. My life is going to be different from now on. I've decided to put Jesus on the throne of my heart. Amen. And some of us in today's environment in the church world have heard nothing but messages that say when you begin to know Jesus, there's nothing but the favor of God in your life. All that happens is you walk around in, well, they call it a fog, favor of God, F-O-G. And I don't know why I just, I just delight so much <laughs> in just going after it because here's the thing. They walk around in this fog, they think, and then just people fall at their feet and throw money at them and just move aside in traffic and give them free groceries and pay their bills for them. No, guess what? None of that happens. None of that happens. If they say it's happening, they're lying because that is not what God has in mind. What he has in mind is those that serve the Lord are going to have to suffer persecution. Those that serve the Lord are going to have to pay a price. Those that decide that I'm not of the world any longer are going to have to walk away from some friendships, are going to have to walk away even sometimes from family members that are not real happy about losing a member of their worldliness and their worldly tribe am i telling the truth is there anybody in this house that you just decided to follow jesus and it was just happiness and just just you know walk in the park and a picnic every day and, and anybody because you're not doing it right if that's the case <laughs> How can you say that? I've had people tell me, if you would just change your message a little bit, just tweak it. Just tweak it a little bit. Make it a more positive message. Polish it up. Make it more attractive. You could double, triple, quadruple your church, whatever the five one is, your church. <laughs> but you know what? I've been through too much to lie to you. <laughs> As long as there's breath in this body, I'm going to preach the same truth that I had to suffer for. 
that I had to pay for because the word of God puts it this way. It says you're going to have to buy the truth and sell it not. It will cost you something to know the truth. Listen, you can listen to the lies that even those in the church will perpetrate so that they can line their pockets with all the money of the people that want to walk around in the fog if you want to. But as long as this boy's breathing air, I'm going to preach the word of God. I've, I've come this far, and I'm not turning around. I've come this far, and God has kept me. And I've come to tell you that his word is going to prevail. It is forever settled in heaven. And listen, if you think I say it a lot, you're going to hear it from now on until Jesus comes. Because the word of God is our foundation. It is the word of God that we better be anchored to. Preachers come and preachers go. Programs come and programs go. But the word of God is forever. First Peter, the first chapter in the seventh verse, we're not going to go there, but it just compares the trial of your faith to the testing and the purging and the refining of gold. It says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than that of gold, though the gold be tried in the fire. Go to 1 Peter, the fourth chapter. Let's jump to the fourth chapter in the 12th verse. It says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial. Come on, am I telling the truth here? That you're going to go through something. It's not strange. It's supposed to happen. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing had happened unto you. But, but I was supposed to walk around in the fog. Nope, you've been lied to. You've been lied to. What's supposed to happen is you're supposed to go through the fiery trial. Why? Because it's doing something in you. Look at this. The next verse 13, it says, but rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings. That when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be, all, uh, be glad also with exceeding joy. So how does that work? I'm supposed to go through fiery trials in order to know how to rejoice and be glad and have joy. Well, some of us have come to an understanding that when you begin to be purified, that it changes you for the better. When you begin to go through that fire and let go of some of those impurities, that your life becomes better on the other side. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. As a matter of fact, in Revelation, the third chapter, 18 and 19, Jesus says this to the church of Laodicea. We're real familiar with this passage. He says this to Laodicea. He says, you're, you're not hot and you're not cold, but you're lukewarm and I'll spew you out of my mouth into the tribulation. You're not going to be part of the bride of Christ. You will not go with me when I come to take my bride. But he says this, there is something that you can do. It's not too late. The door is still open. And here's what he says to the church of Laodicea, the church of the fog, the church that is so interested in being rich and increased with good and in need of nothing. Come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about today. I can't, I can't go further on it today. I've got too much to cover. But you know what I'm talking about, the church of Laodicea. Here's what Jesus says to them in the book of Revelation. He said, you're going to have to buy from me gold tried in the fire. Buy it from me. Oh, but Jesus, just give it to me because I don't, I don't want to be in the tribulation. I don't want to have to go. No, no, no. You're going to have to pay for it. You're going to have to do something in order to obtain this treasure. You're going to have to go through some things in order to have the gold that is tried in the fire. The gold that is tried in the fire is purified by the refiner. Praise God. So these are the messages that we've heard over and over and over again, the gold tried in the fire. But I want to skip ahead past those difficult passages for some of you. They're only difficult <laughs> if you're not tithing. 
I mean, let's be real. I love reading through the middle of the third chapter of the book of Malachi. I love it. You know why? Because I'm a tither. Because I learned long ago that I receive protection from God. I receive blessing from God. I receive promises from God that you don't have. You'll never have if you're not a tither with me. Come on, get on the bandwagon. Get into the promises of God. Get into the blessings of God. It will change your life. God is true. He is not a man that he can lie. And he said, try me and see if I won't pour out a blessing that you cannot contain. So that's what the tithe and the offering is all about. He said, just give it a try. What do you have to lose? Just give it a try. Either I'm God or I'm not God. You're going to find out that I am God and that I am going to do what I said I would do. Come on, somebody. And listen, you don't want to hear those scriptures only if you're not a tither. Oh, it's just so quiet right now. It's the Word of God. And, and you know what? Even It's just a practical fact. Just do it, and God will bless you. You don't even have to be holy to receive the benefit of the tithe. You don't have to be a good person to receive the benefit of the tithe. You can be a nasty old rank, horrible attitude, prideful, awful Jezebel kind of nasty person. And if you begin to give the tithe unto God, your household is going to receive a blessing and the enemy is going to be rebuked for you. But you know what else is going to happen? God's going to begin to change you because you're going to find out who God is. You're going to become acquainted with somebody named Jehovah Jireh, who's the provider that'll come through when nothing else is working for you God is going to keep his word Who? and see the rest of us love that that because we know it's true we could go through we could go through an hour of testimonies about it praise God but I want to jump ahead and to uh, and go to the last part of that chapter the 14th verse because two things are happening in this chapter, and God is doing two different things. The 14th, this is Malachi 3.14, it says, Ye have said it is vain to serve God. Who's he talking to? Well, we just passed the middle part where he said, You've robbed me in your tithes and offerings. So what is he talking about? He's talking about the people that are just wanting to rewrite what God said. And rewrite the way that you receive the promises of God. We say it around here a lot that the promises of God have conditions attached to them. <laughs> because God said, if you do this, then I'm going to come through and do this. But if you do this, mm, mm, yeah, then I'm going to do this. So you understand that there are conditions in the word of God. And, and so that's who he's talking to. He said, those of you, I just want you to, to step into obedience so that you can be blessed. And then he continues and he says, you have said this. The reason you're not obeying the word of God is because you're looking to the worldly people, to the ones that are doing it differently, and you're admirers of the wicked. I'm going to show it to you. Even in the church, how many know there are admirers of the wicked? There are churches that are shaping their message and forming their their programs and building their entire church around the things that are being uh, spoken and, and the things that are being uh, put out there politically. Come on. Some churches are so much about politics, they've got to have a little commercial to talk about Jesus for two seconds. And then they get back to all the political stuff. You know why? Because they're admirers of the wicked. And here's what, what it says. It says, you've said it's vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? I want to tell you something, that not everybody that goes to church and just speaks the name of Jesus is serving God. Because in Matthew, the seventh chapter, Jesus makes it very clear. He said, in the last days, there are a whole bunch of religious folks. There's a whole bunch of Holy Ghost folks. There's a whole bunch of church folks that are going to come to me and they're going to say, Lord, we were the ones that had the 
the church programs going. We were the ones even that cast out devils. We were the ones that saw miracles. We were the ones that did all these things in your name. And he's going to say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. That's what he said. You see, the church is never going to be successful patterning themselves after the world. Because Jesus said, if you serve me, the world's going to hate your guts. He said this, if they hated me, you think they're not going to hate you? Of course they're going to hate you because you are not of the world. You're in it, but you're not of it. I've called you out of it. I put my name on you. I've washed you with my blood. And you've got to come out from among them and be separate. If you want to be my son, if you want to walk with me, if you want to reign and rule in eternity with me, you're going to have to step away from the crowd not emulate them. And that's what he's addressing here. He's saying, well, well, they're not serving God, and it's going pretty well for them. See, there's a difference in serving God and preaching a whole message that God's supposed to serve you. Oh, I just want to walk in the favor of God. Really, what have you done for God lately? Because Jesus said, if you love me, you don't just sing, you know, all these sing-songy, crazy songs that I heard all day yesterday on a certain radio station. Just love, 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 love. Okay, God's love, that's great. That's about that shallow. You know what Jesus said? He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's what he said. That's what he said. <laughs> I don't know what to do for you if you don't believe it. It's there. It's the word. But he said this. There's a difference in those that are serving me. He said, you're looking at those and you're saying, wow, they're not really serving God. They're just uh, walking around in, in, in whatever they believe. And it seems like everything's happening for them. Look at the next verse. It says, and now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness, they're set up. Yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. Do I really need to serve the Lord when it's going so well for those that are just walking around and getting all the goodies? But the Word of God continues. Look at this. Then they that feared the Lord. I said, then... They that feared the Lord spake often one to another. You see, the ones that decide that they're going to serve the Lord because they're bought with a price, the ones that separate themselves from the things of the world and the messages even in the church emulating the world, the ones that decide no matter what it takes, no matter how hot the fire gets, no matter if they turn the furnace up seven times hotter, I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to make it to the end. I've decided to follow Jesus and I'm not turning around. I've got a made up mind. I've decided that I'm going to do what he wants me to do. Go where he wants me to go. I'm going to serve the Lord with everything that I am. My substance, my heart, my life, my words, everything that I am, it belongs to him because in him we live and we move and we have our being. And Jesus said, if you abide in me, live in me. Don't visit me once in a while. But if you live in me, and then I live in you. That's when the promises begin to kick in. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They that feared the Lord spake often one to another. You know why they were talking to each other about it? You see, those that fear God are a different breed. 
The Bible says this, that the Lord is greatly to be feared in the assembly of his saints. The Bible says this, that the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge and the beginning of wisdom. The word of God said this, that the fear of the Lord is where the secret of the Lord dwells. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. I want to tell you, the fear of God means walking into his holiness. The fear of God is what the priest went through once a year when he put his garments on and he bathed himself and he got himself exactly precisely in line and in order. Why? Because he was about to go through the veil into the holy of holies, into the presence of a mighty God, a fearful God, a righteous God, a holy God. And he didn't go in just just cavalier and, and just thinking, oh, I'm just going to get this done, get this over with and, and then we'll eat something later and we'll have a little reception. No, he he understood he might not survive that encounter in the holy of holies unless he prepared himself, unless he had a healthy fear of God. Amen. And so this is where God is calling us at this precise moment. This is what God is revealing to us in this time, is that we are to be those who fear God, who walk in the fear of the Lord. God is revealing to us, look, if you've been trying to command angels and they're not listening to you, it's because they live in the fear of God, in the holiness of God. It's because they are in a different realm and they understand the, the God that they see face to face they stand in his holiness look we wouldn't survive it in these current bodies but the word of God said that they behold his face they behold his face these angels that God has given to us to command and the reason that they're not listening to some of you is because you're not walking in the fear of God you don't have that respect that holiness that place where it doesn't matter what's going on in in your attitude it doesn't matter what's going on in your life God is holy God is just God is righteous and you better get yourself in line before before you walk into it, those are the ones that fear God. The ones that walk in and say, I better, I better get myself in order. I better leave this stuff at the door because no matter what I'm going through, I don't have to understand it. I don't have to comprehend it. But he's God and he's holy. He's God and he's righteous. And when I come into his presence, I better have a healthy dose of respect. The church world's just doing everything they can to bring God down to the lowest common denominator. It's just, I mean, I'm waiting for the song to come out that he's just my little buddy. <laughs> Long time ago, there was a song that said, God's my co-pilot. Really? I know there was a book by that name and so on, but... Look, if God's your co-pilot, you got some problems. He doesn't want to be your co-pilot. He wants you to put yourself on the altar and live for him. So that's what this is talking about, is those that live for God. We're going to see this uh, in, in the next verse here. But it says that those that live for God, those that fear God, they're talking about it one to another. And here's why to get back to the question. <laughs> you know why we've got, we've got to talk to those who've received the same revelations that we've received about those things? Number one, everyone's going to think you're crazy because they have no idea what, what you're talking about. But the reason those that feared God talked often about it one to another is because nobody else wanted to listen. In the church world even, nobody wanted to hear it. Nobody wanted to receive that. It's going to cost me something. Have you ever gone to a timeshare and, and you've been, you know, had this great weekend and woo, free everything. And then all of a sudden they get you into a room and they begin the sales pitch. And you begin to realize, hmm, maybe this weekend wasn't free after all. And maybe I'm not going to be able to get out of here. And you, you try to, if there's two of you, you try to, you know, whisper and figure out skin 
schemes of how to get out of the room and, and how to escape the sales pitch. But you find out that it's going to cost you something and your heart begins to sink because it wasn't free after all. Well, listen, I want to tell the people of God, it was never going to be free. It was never going to be something that did not cost you to walk in the place of walking in his presence, in his holiness, in the fear of God. It'll cost you everything because God is a consuming fire. Salvation's free. But fearing God will cost you everything. So that's what he's talking about here. Look at this, though. It says, Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord heard it. <laughs> How many know that God hears our conversations to one another? God hears it when you're encouraging somebody. God hears those dinner table conversations uh, when you're talking about uh, whether you're discouraged uh, or whether you're encouraged uh, or whether God's good uh, or whether you're mad at him. I don't recommend that one uh, because God uh, is a righteous God. You ought to be afraid of him, not mad at him. Uh, he's right uh, and you're wrong. Uh, he's holy uh, and you're just trying to get there. Come on, somebody. Uh, he's perfect uh, in everything he does. Uh, every word he speaks, uh, the way that he does it, uh, everything about out. What he does is perfect because he's a holy God. He's a righteous God. He doesn't need you. He is God by himself. Yet he decided to go to Calvary and to shed his blood so that you could walk in that same holiness in relationship with him. You know why we preach holiness? Because without holiness, no man will see the Lord. That, that word see, it means really experience. It's talking about intimacy. You can't know God on an intimate level without walking in holiness. Why? Because God is holy. You'll never understand him until you begin to walk in the fear of God, walk in the reverence of God. And here's what happened. He heard the conversations. He heard the Bible studies that were being taught he heard those of us that were just having conversations and saying I'm beginning to see things like I've never known them before and I've got a hunger like I've never had to walk in the fear of God to walk in his holiness to know him to seek his face I don't know where it came from but I just began to step into it a little bit and all of a sudden it began to consume me I want to know him I don't care if he blesses me, I don't care. If he heals me, I don't care. If he gives me things and blesses me again, I just have to know him. I want to know him. So it's those that are serving God, and it's those that walk in the fear of God. And he heard their conversations. And the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. Is that talking about everybody in the church? Is that talking about everybody that's saved? No. Sadly, no. It's talking about the ones that fear God because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And you're going to talk about what God is doing. You're going to talk about what's on your heart and what's on your mind. And those that begin to talk about it and express themselves in it and begin to try to help others receive it. Come on. When I receive something good, I want you to get a dose of it. When I hear something from God, I can't wait to come and deliver it for whoever wants to receive it. Why? Because I've been changed by the Word. I've been redesigned by the Word of God. It's molecularly, spiritually molecularly changed me. And I can't wait to deliver the word because the hope is that just, just one even or just two, if they can get a hold of that same anointed word of God, the same thing that God is speaking to the people that are hungry and thirsty to hear something from the word of God. You know what? If, if it can just get a hold of one or two, then it's going to be so exciting for me to watch God move upon you and in this church. And I found this. It's, it becomes contagious. 
contagious because when somebody gets a hold of it, Sister Julie begins to speak it. She can't testify without talking about it. And it begins to come forth from her. Why? Because it's in her heart. It's changed her. It's become part of who she is. And she begins to talk about it. And pretty soon, I notice that others in her circle begin to speak with a different vocabulary and a different level of understanding. And I begin to see that not just the conversation is different, but I begin to see change because of the Word of God. Hallelujah. Praise God. And so he's writing a book of remembrance for those that fear him. Those that fear him. Not the ones walking around like this. What can I get? 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 Maybe, maybe my bills will be paid off if I just get out of bed and go to church. <laughs> maybe, maybe I can just uh, get, you know, uh, some of that stuff. You know, they testify about this, this stuff that goes on. Uh, and maybe I just, I'll just walk in and maybe that, some of that will just rub off on me. Uh, and and the, the hand is just open. What can I get? What can I get? What can I get? I must confess uh, that a lot of my pre-service prayer used to be, Lord, meet all the needs of your people. And Lord, those that have this wrong, touch them. And those that are sick, touch them. Nothing wrong with those prayers, except I found out that's not what I want at all. Because when I seek the face of God, he's going to be the healer of all of my diseases. When I begin to forget about everything, but walk it in the fear and the holiness of God, he's going to take care of deliverance. He's going to make a way out of no way for you. You. He's going to take care of everything. The Word of God says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and everything else is going to be done for you. Hallelujah. Seek first His kingdom. Don't seek first your healing, don't seek first your family situations being taken care of. Don't seek first first uh, that you you got a little pain here and and so i'm just coming at you no no no. he knows those that serve him and that fear him and he wrote a book about us (laughs) hallelujah look at this and they shall be mine who who the ones that I wrote a book about, the ones that are walking in the fear of my holiness, they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, by the way. In that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Are you seeing what's here my son that serveth me come on somebody (laughs) you see God didn't just lead us and we we just jumped over a chasm no there have been some steps in receiving what God is speaking to us we've had some revelations that have taken us one line upon the next line precept upon precept there's been a time of building and understanding you could never comprehend what God is speaking if you hadn't received what he had to tell you before he had to build a foundation of revelation he had to check you out and see whether you were willing to buy the truth and sell it not before he could help you to understand the things that he's speaking and revealing in this day but he's saying this he said he said that those that serve me those that just say lord i'm yours good bad everything it's yours every decision i make every thought that i think i bring it in captivity to the knowledge of christ in the name of jesus even my attitudes belong to you god purge me seek god i'm seeking you lord above everything else 
Those are the ones that he's talking about, just in case you didn't pick up on that. <laughs> he's, uh, he's talking about uh, the ones that walk uh, in his fear, uh, the ones that want to serve him no matter what. Uh, those are the ones. Uh, those are mine. Uh, those are the ones uh, that I'm going to, uh, to bring uh, in the last day. Uh, I'm going to spare them uh, from the tribulation uh, that is coming upon this world. Uh, I'm going to spare them uh, from the judgment. Uh, we sing the song. Uh, oh, look, uh, we're not going to go through the white throne judgment. Uh, we're not going to go through uh, the things that others are going to have to stand before. Why? Because he said, I'm going to spare them. They're mine. They're seeking my face. They're my sons. And they're the ones walking in my fear and holiness. They're my jewels. So, the two things that God is doing in this chapter is he is purging gold and silver. He's the refiner of gold and silver. But also in this same chapter, he's making up jewels. Are they one and the same? Well, I did a little bit of research. You may think that gold is precious and that it's rare, but did you know that it is one of the most abundant elements on the face of the earth? As a matter of fact, I found out this. Scientists tell us that at the core of the earth, there is so much pure gold that it would cover the entire surface of the planet, the entire surface of the planet to a depth of about a foot and a half. That's how much gold there is just at the core. That's not the gold that we mine in the mines, but just in the core. That's how common gold is. Yet that gold, Jesus uh, is refining it. He is the refiner. He is purifying it. There's a process that when you come to know him, you're going to have to go through the fire just a little bit. But you know what? I found out that the refining process takes place in just one setting. In just one experience in the fire, the gold is purified. The gold is purified. And the typical fire burns at between 1,100 and 1,800 degrees. Well, pure gold has a melting point of 1,945 degrees. So what typically goes on is the things that are impure begin to melt and begin to come to the surface. But the gold itself, the reason is tried in the fire. See, tried is not the same as refined. He's refining it by trying it in the fire. But you know what trying means? It's meaning test, it means testing the gold to see the level of purity. That trial, yeah, is bringing impurities to the surface, but it's melting things away from you and it's showing what you're really made out of. But can I tell you that it is common for every individual to go through that, every person that is saved to go through the fire. He said, uh, we, we read it in, in 1 Peter. He said, don't think it's strange. It's an ordinary thing. You've got to expect that you're going to go through the fire. And the refiner is going to use the fire to pull the things that are hard away from you. Did you know that, that gold is one of the very softest metals on the face of the earth? And the only reason that it is hardened is when it's mixed with other things that are less pure and, and things that cause it to be hardened. And so the first stage, the first thing that God wants everybody to go through is that he wants to begin the fire that, that has you hardened by the things of the world. He wants to cause the fire to go up just, just below your melting point. <laughs> just below your melting point, about 1,800 degrees, because he knows 1945, you'd melt. But he wants all that other stuff melted. He wants to soften you. That's the first stage. But I found out that, that there's a, an entirely different thing that's going on a little bit lower in the earth, a little bit deeper experience. <clears throat> How many have had plenty of experience with the fiery trials? 
You know what I'm talking about. This is familiar to you. You know what it, but let me tell you about the fiery trial for just one second. Here's the thing about it. You, you got your shield of faith, right? So that you can quench the fiery darts of the enemy. Is that right? That's what the shield of faith does according to the word of God. You quench, you put them out. You can learn to preempt. Come on, somebody, hear me. Preemptive joy. You can learn to preempt. You can learn what the enemy is going to do next. And you can put up your shield of faith and you can be victorious is preemptively and you can learn to walk through the fire we've preached sister Evelyn and we've told people just hold on because joy comes in the morning we've told people just a little bit longer it's not always going to be like that and look I reserve the right to say that again if I need to but I want to tell somebody something that when those that go deeper deeper in their experience with God I'm not talking about the surface experience of just going from one trial to the next Oh, here I am on the mountaintop. Oh, here I am in the valley. Oh, but there's another mountaintop right over here so I can hold on. I know that God is going to come through. I know in whom I have believed, the same one that took me from that trial and brought me back to victory, he's going to do it again so I can, I can hang on in the valley. We've written songs about it. We've talked about it, preached about it, taught about it. But what happens when you go deeper? You see, the process is completely different at a depth of about a hundred miles down. And you know what the difference is? Number one, there's molten magma down there. And this process doesn't start. I told you gold melts at 1945 Fahrenheit. But this process doesn't start until you get up to about 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And somewhere between 2,000 and 2,200 degrees Fahrenheit at a deeper place. Can I tell you that there's the same fire, as a matter of fact, it's hotter than anything that you've experienced as gold that's being tried in the fire. But there's an uncommon uh, process that is taking place. I told you, God is doing two different things in this chapter. He's the refiner of the silver and he's the refiner of the gold. But at the end of the chapter, he said there's a different group of people. They're the ones that are seeking my face. They're the ones walking in the fear of God. They're the ones that want to go deeper. And you know what the difference is? The difference is in addition to that intense heat experience 100 miles below the surface where nobody can see what you're going through. Nobody is there to encourage you. Nobody understands what is happening. Why? Because you're 100 miles down. And there's something about seeking after the truth of the Word of God. It takes you deeper. It takes you deeper. So you don't have the luxury of just screaming and crying to everybody. I'm going through a trial. Everybody feels sorry for me. You can scream all you want. You're 100 miles down. But here's the difference. There's no release from the experience a hundred miles down. It is a constant temperature and it takes place without stopping. And not only that, there is pressure that didn't exist in the refining process. There is pressure, 725,000 pounds of pressure per square inch at 200 miles below the earth's surface in 2200 degrees of temperature and here's the thing you don't go from one fiery pressure filled experience to the next you're down there for the long haul and there's pressure that doesn't stop and you, you begin to wonder God I'm used to the mountaintop experience I'm used to you come through and you make a way and then maybe if I come down to a place of difficulty a place where okay I don't understand but I'm just waiting for the mountaintop come on somebody hear me you know that when you're going through those trials some of you just shut down I 
I've been there too. It's what I do as far as my personality. I just hunker down because the Word of God said this. Paul told Timothy, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And look, if that's what it takes to get you through, then go ahead. Use that. I've used it myself. God says, endure hardness. I'm just going to go through it because I know that one day that there's going to be joy and happiness and release from this trial. But guess what? When you begin to go deeper, there's no more release. And when I begin to walk through some things, some trials that didn't go according to the formula that I thought I understood, that I preached for many, many years in this church and on the evangelistic field, what happens when things don't happen the way you think you understand them? The way you think the Word describes them. What happens when that pressure just grabs a hold of your brain like a vice day after day after day after day after day? Are you still going to live for God? Are you still going to make it through? Are you? I'm telling you, that endure hardness thing starts to lose its validity and starts to lose its effectiveness, starts to wear a little bit thin when you go in one year, two years, three years, and the pressure is not released and you you don't find yourself on that mountaintop and you don't have that time of restoring and renewing but you're in the depths of the things of God and God is forming something you see at 2200 degrees and at 725,000 pounds of pressure per square inch a new process begins to take place that gold is already pure that soft substance is already pure with with just one experience, one fiery trial, with one time of testing and purging and one trip through the refining fire. But can I tell you, over thousands and millions and even billions of years, that unrelenting pressure is causing an entirely different process to begin. And a completely different substance begins to form. Come on, somebody hear me today. You say, well, how can it be millions and billions of years when we know the history of how God created the earth? God created the, the earth with a history, you see. God created the earth because uh, he knew that there were things that needed to be ready. There were trees on the earth when he created it. There weren't just, you know, just here's your bag of seeds and good luck to you. Scientists tell us this. The youngest diamond is 900 million years old. And the oldest is 3.2 billion years old. But something begins to take place in this uncommon environment. And when those diamonds are formed, the crystallization of that carbon that's been under that intense pressure and heat, unrelenting at a depth of a hundred miles in the earth. If something happens, it becomes bigger than it was. <laughs> it becomes something that it didn't used to be. It expands, and it's the very expansion of that diamond that causes the magma around it to, to be expelled and there's an eruption of that magma that causes that diamond to go from a hundred miles down in an eruption pushed by the very heat and by the very fire that diamond that's pure that diamond that has been forged through all that unrelenting pressure it is propelled to the surface by the very magma that was taking place in its formation. Can somebody hear what I'm saying today? The very thing that God is allowing to put pressure on you and to turn up the heat on you is the thing that's making you something that you never would be without it. It couldn't happen in just one sitting. This is not about refining gold. It's about becoming a jewel. It's about becoming the jewels that Jesus said. These are the ones that 
that fear me. These are the ones that have decided to serve me. These are the ones that didn't give up. These are the ones that I'm going to use in the last day. And the word of God said this. It said, I'm going to spare them because they're my sons. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 18 says, Then ye shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. What's that talking about? It's talking about judging the earth, ruling and reigning with Christ in the millennium. Can I tell somebody, how would you know whether somebody's serving God or not? Unless you were the ones that were serving him. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, is this what we're resigned to? I'll be honest with you. These are the conversations I have with God. I don't have time to get into some of the experiences that I've had recently that felt like they were never going to end. The vice that has been around my head for month after month after month. I won't get into it. You've heard some of it. Last year was one of the most difficult years I've ever gone through. Why? Because the trial just didn't quit. The pressure didn't relent. I didn't have a restoration period where, whew, I'm cooling off and the pressure's off and I, it's just joy and, oof, maybe that fog isn't sounding too bad after all. pressure just kept on kept on and I have these conversations with God is this is this what it's going to be now I mean I I went through times where I just looked for one positive thing in my day to hang on to just one just one huh. you think that you had ba bad days <laughs> where everything goes wrong pen you pick up a pen and it explodes in your hand and you know you stub your toe and <laughs> I'm not kidding you one time I was going through one of those days and I, I just I thought if I'm getting out of my office everything's going wrong I stepped out of my office I thought I'll just clean the pool and I just walked out and start cleaning the pool a bat flew into my back I was afraid to go to bed. I was afraid, <laughs> afraid the ceiling would fall in or something. <laughs> Jewels require constant pressure that gold will never understand. You see, gold is one of the most common elements on the face of the earth. Being tried by fire and with all due respect the refiner's fire is a real shallow experience it's a real shallow experience thank God for it it's part of living for God I, I will celebrate anybody that's living for God you understand any experience with the Lord is fantastic it's phenomenal but for those that are walking deep <laughs> he's making up jewels and can I tell you this I want you to understand this it says in the last days when I make up my jewels and that word make up right there that phrase make up in the it's not make up it's it's when I'm making up my jewels don't get weird on me <laughs> That phrase is asaw, asaw in the Hebrew. And it means this, get this. Jesus said, when I make up, when I make my jewels. And do you know what that means? That word asaw in the Hebrew, it means to press and to squeeze. And the title of my message here at the end of my message is squeezed by God. Because he said, I'm the one. I'm the refiner. Oh, but there's a deeper thing that I'm doing to those that will walk in the fear of God and seek my face and want something beyond the surface experience and jumping from one mountain to the next for those that are going to be in it for the long haul. Those that want to serve me. Those that want to be my bride. Those that are seeking first the kingdom of God. It's going to take some pressure because I'm making something in you. I'm pressing. 
and I'm squeezing and it's not going to relent because the time is short. I've only got a little bit more time to make the jewels that are going to be in my kingdom that are going to rule and reign with me. Oh, don't despise what you're going through today. Don't despise the unrelenting pressure. I come to tell you, God is doing the squeezing. God is doing the squeezing. 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, the 13th verse. It says this. There hath no temptation taken you but such as common to man. But God is faithful. Now, we can stop there and just shout all over because that's, that's a good verse right there. Good part of the verse. God is faithful. But look at this. Who will not allow you, suffer you, or allow you to be tempted or tested above what you're able now, we have tried to use this verse to encourage each other. And we were out of our minds trying to use this verse to encourage each other. Because <laughs> the only way you can use this to encourage me is by stopping right there. Right? That's what every single song does that talks about this. You've heard them. He knows how much you can bear. Ooh, and some of us grab on to, well, he'll make a way of escape. Hallelujah, way of escape. Wow, that sounds fantastic. Sounds like I'm going to get out of this valley and be back on mountaintop because I'm going to escape what I'm going through. You see, this is not talking about the purging of gold and the, the, the refining of gold. This is talking about that experience of becoming a jewel because, you see, there's pressure involved. There's no pressure in the refining of gold. There's just heat. But can I tell somebody today that that pressure, it weighs down upon you and God knows what is going to crush you and He knows how much you're able to bear. And thank God, He's so wonderful. He gives you a way of escape that you might be able to bear it. Don't encourage me with this scripture, please. You see, he wants you to be pressed. He wants you to be in the vice. So I said to God, in fact, many times I've said to God, is this just where we're at now? Because you see, I can't give up. I wouldn't even know how to give up. I'm in so deep, giving up, it, 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 that'd be harder than just going on. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I don't even know who I am without Jesus. I don't even know how to live for the devil. I, I don't even know what, what to do if I don't have Jesus in my life. So giving up was never an option. It's never been an option. But my, my conversation with the Lord has been just, Lord, oh, is this really, really it? I, this is the year of joy. All kinds of joy, four varieties of joy. That's what you gave me. And all I get is the vice squeezing my head. <laughs> so am I just supposed to be miserable? I literally said that to God. I talked to him in my car so nobody else can hear. <laughs> I don't know, Google is listening though, I'll tell you that. I was speaking in tongues in my car one time recently, and, and Google said, I'm sorry, I don't know how to help with that. I said, shut up, I didn't ask for your help, I'm talking to God. But I said, God, is this really it? I've served you all my life. The, 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 you know, a few years in there, I didn't know I could, but, but I've served you every way that I could and every way that I knew how to my whole life. Is this really what it's going to be like? I'm just going to be miserable from now on and pretend that I'm having joy. I'm getting ready to close. But I can't leave you hanging here because God spoke to me and it changed my life. And God has an answer for you. He had an answer for me. Listen, don't ever be afraid to ask God hard questions. He's not intimidated by the likes of you. He's going to give you an answer. And God is, is a, a loving God. He purchased you because he loves you. I want to tell you there is an answer because in the book of Acts, the second chapter and the 
fourth verse, it said that they got together in the upper room and they began to seek the Lord as they had been instructed to so that the power would fall upon them. But the Word of God said in verse 4, then they received the Holy Ghost. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. I said they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And the Spirit of God spoke to me. He said the problem is not the pressure that's coming down around you and on you and all on all sides of you. The problem is that you don't have enough Holy Ghost power pushing out from the inside of you. The pressure is going to be there because you're seeking my face. Because you said, I want to know what you're doing. I want to know your truth. Lord, I want to walk in the fear of God. You step down into a place of unrelenting pressure. But the reason that you're about to be crushed is because you've got to be filled up. Can I tell somebody today, it's a very simple equation that the Holy Ghost revealed to me. It said this, 1 John 4 and 4, greater, greater, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I come to tell you, your problem is not that you're about to be crushed by the pressure of life and the pressure of your situations. Your problem is that you're not filled. You see, here's what Jesus said. He said, they that believe on me, as the scripture hath said, out of their belly, their innermost being, is going to flow rivers of living water. You see, here's what happens when the pressure inside becomes greater than the pressure outside. Something's going to give. The gates are going to have to open, and the Spirit of God is going to begin to push out from the inside, not only are you not going to be aware of the pressure outside any longer you're not going to feel it you're going to walk in joy you're going to walk in peace you're going to walk in righteousness in the Holy Ghost it's in the Holy Ghost the kingdom of God is not meat and drink but it's righteousness peace and joy in the Holy Ghost the Spirit of God spoke to me and he said your problem is you got to be filled on a, a, a daily basis You've got to be filled. You've got to be filled because you can't allow one for one second the pressure inside to decrease to the point where the pressure outside is going to crush you and, and cause you to begin to think in a, a different way. No, I want to tell somebody today, all you've got to do is get filled with the power, is become immersed in the power, is to become in the power like never before because Jesus said it's the power that they received on the day of Pentecost. You'll receive power. Ephesians 5.15 says, Be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. So I've come to tell somebody today, the answer is not asking God to take the pressure away. The answer is not even trying to come up. You know what I do? It, when I perceive that God's not doing uh, what I asked him to, Paul even had uh, a good uh, experience with this. He said, Lord, take this thorn away. Mm, nothing. Um, Lord, take this thorn away. Hmm, uh, must be doing something wrong because, you know, yesterday I, I asked him to raise the dead and they got up and walked. <laughs> Yesterday, I, I, I saw Jesus on the road to Damascus. I've had these, these supernatural experiences, and today I'm just asking that a thorn be taken out of my flesh. Come on, somebody, hear me today. Paul said, I asked the Lord three times, take this condition out of my life. God, you're the one that called me, and I'm preaching that you can do these things. But look at me. Why am I going through this? Why am I having to put up with this? But Paul said this. He said, I found out that God had a reason for what he was allowing me to walk through because it was shaping something it was making something in me the answer is not Lord take the pressure away the answer is get yourself filled if it takes every single day getting on your knees until you pray through. You know, the old timers had a, a term. I still like it. It said pray through. That means you, 
you pray until something happens. You don't get up until something happens. You don't quit halfway. You say, Lord, if you did it in the Bible days, I'm not getting up from here until you filled me up over and over and over until, God, it's not just in me, but it's flowing out of me. Flowing out of me like a river of living water. Hallelujah. See, it's just a simple scientific equation. It's just the science of the invisible. You get the pressure inside equal to the pressure outside. You're not going to feel the pressure outside anymore. Come on. I need you to get a hold of that. I said you get the pressure equal on the inside. All of a sudden, you're, you're like, what, what, what pressure? I don't notice it. I just All I know is that I'm happy and I've got joy and I'm walking in peace and I'm walking in the promises of God. What pressure are you talking talking about uh, how can I have peace that's the peace that passes understanding that's the peace uh, that people look at you and say I wouldn't survive that what's wrong with you well I've got calm delight because it's what God said I can have when the Holy Ghost power is pushing out of me so when the pressure is equal you're not going to feel the pressure outside in fact it's going to feel normal it's a normal day when you got that pressure when you've got the Holy Ghost pressure pushing out out. Oh, but when you begin to increase the power of God. I told you these are the chapters of power. I told you I prophesied over this church and I told you God has spoken to this pastor and he said I'm increasing your power. I'm increasing your power. I come to tell somebody today that God is not satisfied with just giving you barely enough pressure so that you can have an equilibrium and that you can not have to suffer through your trials and not be miserable through your trials. You can't be miserable miserable and walk in joy at the same time you're going to have to pick one you're going to have to decide which one do you want the answer is I want all of the power I want all of the pressure inside of me from the power of the Holy Ghost because when it begins to press out and the pressure inside of me is even greater than all the pressure the 725,000 pounds per square inch that's making me a diamond can I tell you when the pressure gets bigger and higher and and more inside of me it's going to come out and it's going to touch other lives and it's going to make a difference in my environment I want to tell you that's when you're going to walk into a room and heads are going to turn not because of what you're wearing but because the very atmosphere begins to change from the power of God that is coming forth and forcing its way out of you Brother Nate, would you come? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now I need you to pay attention. I need you to pay attention. I'm wrapping this up. But here's what the Lord spoke to me. He said, gold is common. That is common. Diamonds are rare for obvious reasons. Come on, somebody. And he said this. He said this. He said, sounds a whole lot like many are called, but few are chosen, doesn't it? That's what he said. Hallelujah. And then he said this. He said, do you remember that Malakos thing? Remember that Malakos thing? <laughs> because 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, the ninth and 10th verses tell us that there's no Malakos in Basilea. There's no Malakos. What's Malakos? It's a Greek word. It means soft ones. Soft ones. You see, pure gold is one of the softest metals that exists on the face of the earth. Soft. And if it stays in that state, it's, it's going to be so soft that it's not good for a whole lot. But diamond is the hardest natural substance on the face of the earth. And malakos in the Greek simply means this, soft ones. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians, there's no soft ones in Basilea in the kingdom of God. You see, you're going to have to be hardened in a godly way in order to rule and reign with him. In order to step into a place to command angels 
you can't just be so soft, you're just going to fall apart. No malicose in Basilea. I said there's no malicose in Basilea. One more scripture, 2 Thessalonians, the first chapter, the fourth and fifth verses. So that we ourselves glory. <laughs> What's glory? It's the power of God. So that we ourselves glory in you and the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. Look at this next verse, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye suffer. Look, it's not all in vain. <laughs> Come on, somebody, hear me today. God has a purpose. God has a reason. He's making you into a jewel. He's pressing you. He's pressuring you into what you asked him to make you. He's pressing you into somebody that's not going to be taken apart by the storms. He's making the hardest substance that exists out of you. I mean, let's just be real. Out of us, a big old hot mess that he should have just walked past when he was doing the choosing. Come on, am I telling the truth? I shouldn't have been chosen and neither should have you. But he said, I see something. I see not what she is today. I see not what he's been in the past. I see not what she's done all of her life. But I see something that some pressure is going to cause her to become. It's going to be pure. It's going to be glorious. I'm making up my jewels. Stand with me today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So. You've received the Word of God. You've received some information. Some of you will be able to receive it. Maybe, maybe this feels way off base for where you're at. I don't know. But whoever is receiving what God is speaking today, you've received some information that you're going to have to do something with. Because taking up all your time fretting and worrying and putting frustration on the throne of your life and treating everybody else accordingly is not going to cut it. But you, you cannot be filled with the Holy Ghost and filled with anxiety at the same time. That's right. That's right. Ah. Come on, the Holy Ghost wants to consume you. It's the fire of God. And you're going to begin to have to let go of some fear and some frustration and some things that you, you've become real familiar with. That's why you're not filled with the Holy Ghost because you might have a little bit of Holy Ghost in there, but you got mostly fear and frustration and anxiety. Holy Ghost is speaking to you right now. He said, that's why the pressure is about to destroy you. The pressure is supposed to be there. The anxiety is not. The fear is not. The confusion is not. God is not the author of confusion. He's not the author of confusion. He has not given you the spirit of fear. So today, as always, you've come to a place where you're going to have to take the word of God home with you. Or run away from it but as sure as I'm standing here today this is a turning point for this church yes. Yes. I've heard from God and it's changed my life it's changed my life already it's changed my life you see revelation will change your life I'm not gonna live the same way that I used to live I'm not gonna go through things the same way that I have gone through things just hunker down and wait for the victory to come let's get some mature perspective from the word of God today and I love you all I want you to do is receive the word of God today I can't follow you home and see what you do with it but I can tell you this in the Holy Ghost right now 
I can tell you, I can make a promise to you in the Holy Ghost that if you will take this word and you will apply it to your heart and apply it to your life, to your family situation, to your work situation, to the church situations, I want to tell you, it's going to be different from now on. Brother Glenn, you're going to be a different deacon than you were today. God is going to move upon you if you'll apply this word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I'm going to ask you in the presence of God, don't do it for me. I, I can't keep track of who did and who didn't, but I'm going to ask you right now if you're ready to receive this challenge that has been laid at your feet. If you're ready to apply the Word of God to your life, I'm going to ask you to raise your hands right now in the presence of God and make that commitment right now. Pray and ask the Lord to help you to keep in His Word, not out of it, to, to receive His revelations, not to run from them. Come on. Come on. Hallelujah.